Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Cold Months on the Cape Lookout Jetty, and I'm going to be featuring Captain Justin Ragsdale of Breakday Charters out of Atlantic Beach. And we're going to be covering such areas as the what and when, the boat positioning, rigs and tackle, as well as tides and winds. So a lot of talking points to help you get on the Cape Lookout Jetty and catch some colder month fish. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post, and Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now in this latest and greatest chapter, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast series where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their knowledge, their insights on how to catch more fish more often. And in this endeavor, I am joined, just as I am in every podcast episode, joined by Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Billy, welcome to another episode. Hey, Gary. Good to see you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm uh, you know, excited to talk to a longtime <laughs> friend, Justin, excited to talk about some winter fishing. And, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very much still enjoying the podcast experience, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, man, it's a lot of fun. And if the show is half as good as the pre-show, then we're <laughs> in for a treat on this episode. I'm super excited. So I really appreciate Justin coming and being part of the show again. Um, so I do want to get to some sponsor shout outs really quickly. And I will start with our friends over at RA Hitch. We got Chris and his team at RA Hitch. Hitch's trailers, bike racks, and much more. Be sure to reach out to them um, as you are outfitting your vehicle or anything you need for your outdoor adventure. Always taking care of people, always doing a great job. And be sure to check out their website as well. It's really, uh, really nice. Really nice to scroll through. Gary always loves it and talks about it. Uh, probably more so, Gary, when you're building your new one, but now it's, it's still nice. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I mean, I just dig that someone who appreciates what we're doing, you know, in the business world said, man, I want to I wanna associate my business with that podcast you know, even though it's not a true fishing or boating business. I, I love that he did that. And I do hope that I go fishing with that day one, go fishing with that dude one day out of Moorhead. Yeah. City. Yeah, man, you will. Maybe I'll be back in time to, to join you guys. And then we got a newer sponsor on board with us, uh, Bland Landscaping Company. Uh, you can go to blandlandscapingcompany.com slash careers. And the thing I like about uh, Bland and what they're trying to do is they want to bring on like-minded people and they're outdoorsmen and outdoors women. And they, you know, really pride themselves on having uh, one great pay, great benefits, uh, but then also get, you know, start early, get off early so you can get on the water. Uh, that's one of the things they told us that we want people who are excited to uh, go be with their family, be with their friends and have a good time. So if you're interested in a new career, then go over to their, to their website, blandlandscaping.com slash careers and apply and see if they'll hire you. They get places all over the, all over North Carolina gear. So pretty cool. Yeah, man. And I, I, I hear you, man. It's definitely would be a career move. I would not look at it as a job move. I think yes. they're trying to hire career people to stay with them, take care of them and move them on up, man. I think it, again, I love that he likes what we're doing and he wants to be associated. And I can't imagine we don't have some people watching, listening to the podcast. That would be a great fit for bland landscaping. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing that, you know, and, and one more thing is the CEO got on the phone with me. It wasn't just a recruiting person. It wasn't there. Like the CEO of the company was like, I want to share with you what we're trying to accomplish. So really cool. I go check those, uh, that company out as well. And then our, one of our longest spot, our longest sponsor for the show. And, uh, I don't know how, cause Gary makes fun of them and makes up stuff they say all the time, but Marine Warehouse Center, I got a quick note from them and I'll let Gary defend himself when we get back. The Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. All right, so I was having trouble finding the button there. 
<laughs> so I'll just toss the mic to you, Gary. I'll let you defend yourself because I said you make up. I don't. I mean, I'm great friends with those guys. I don't understand what you mean about having to defend myself. I mean, I, I might, you know, call Terrell out for his bad jokes, but man, sales, service, parts, man, I'm a huge fan of Emmett and Terrell Marine Warehouse Center. They take care of the fish post boat. Yeah, man, those guys do, are yeah. great. You know, telling jokes, Terrell. I don't know. You know, selling parts, you know, <laughs> advising you on parts purchases, home run hitter, telling jokes, work in progress. And and I think one? it'll be evident. I, no, it's not a good one. They're never good ones. You <laughs> you are friendly to them, I but mean, I am not. It's 50-50. Actually, probably I, I am more 75, 75, 25. Yeah, you're more than 50-50. Like you're, yeah. you're forgiving. I mean, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> then again, this is Terrell's joke. Not Gary's. Terrell right. Marine Warehouse. What did the fish's friends tell her when her relationship ended? I have no idea. There are plenty of other fish in the uh, sea. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, boom, boom. So that fell in the 25%, not the 75%, I guess. 25%. We'll see you next week, Terrell. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of fish, I'm going to show you a fish photo so we transition out of this bad joke segment. (laughs) Here we go. We have Brian Bellamy from Wilmington with a trout caught near Carolina Beach on a jig head in saltwater assassin soft plastic. Uh, Looks like he's having a good time. Got a big smile on his face after catching that fish. Nice looking fish there. Good picture, too. Yeah, man, for a selfie, that's a pretty good yeah, shot getting most of that fish nice. in there. I mean, I see a lot of fish photos. I see a lot of selfie fish photos, and that's that's easily in the 75% range when it comes to selfie fish photos. Good for Brian. <laughs> oh, man. We'll see if you make it. Send us your photos. We'll tell you if you're in the 75 or 25%. We'll just go. That's how we'll start uh, judging photos. We're, we're professional photo judges of fish. Um, so, yeah, Gary, good Good, uh, good picture there. Glad, thanks, thanks for sending that in, Brian. And then Gary, thanks for sending it to me to put on the show. It's good looking, good looking fish. Well, yeah, man. So I am going to be heading. I'm going to start talking with Justin um, about colder months on the Cape Lookout Jetty. But Billy, your assignment remains unchanged as it is in every podcast. As soon as I'm done talking with Justin, I'm coming back to you for Billy's best takeaway. Oh, I thought it was to sit here, look good, and push buttons. But all right, I'll have a takeaway for you. Billy's best takeaway. But now it's my turn. It's my my pleasure to welcome to the show Captain Justin Ragsdale. Break day charters out of Atlantic Beach here to talk about cold winter months or cold weather months on the Cape Lookout Jetty. Welcome back to the show, Justin. Thanks for having me back, Gary. Good to be here. Yeah, man. Always enjoy talking to you, whether it's on a podcast or it's at a fishing school or out on your boat, man. And, you know, so looking forward to this conversation because I am a fan of the Cape Lookout Rock Jetty. I haven't spent much time out there, but I am a fan and I'm I'm happy that you're here to talk to us about that topic. Yeah, man. Now, it's a great, it's as be a great place. Now, as the tradition goes on the podcast, you got two questions before we get to the main event. If you're ready, Justin, I'm going to give you question number one. Yes, see. Question number one, why should we listen to anything you have to say about the Cape Lookout Rock Jetty? Because I said so. No, but uh, (laughs) I'm a structure guy. Uh, You know, as long as I can remember saltwater fishing, I've been fishing structure, uh, the jetty structure. You know, I fish a lot of docks. It's just up my alley. It's something that I do, shallow water structure. Um, And it's... uh, it's kind of like fishing a river and the same rocks are in the same place and the current just changes directions. So I've just done a lot of it my whole life. Well, I follow. Good analogy. I like the river analogy. And then now as a uh, tradition has it, question number two, a non-fishing related question. This is actually trivia based. We're going to see, we're going to see how worldly you are. What state, what state, and this is inspired by the Cape Lookout uh, Lighthouse. This is the inspiration of this question. What state in the United States has the most lighthouses? I'm going to say, I'm going to say Maine. And that is a good guess. And the answer does begin with an M, but it's not Maine. It's actually Michigan. Michigan has the most. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of points on those lakes up there to protect against. There's a lot of points. There would be actually 115 of them that have lighthouses on them. How about that? 115. Wow. 
Wow. But enough trivia. Let's talk fishing. I think our first topic up is like the what and when. So, of course, there's fish out there all year round. But I think the winter months are some of your favorites for the rock jetty. You know, how do we define the, the what and where for Cape Lookout rock jetty winter fishing? So, you know, those, those low 60 degree temps, those mid to low 60 degree temps, um, you know, we're going to see those and, you know, we're coming in to late November. Um, I think that's when it really shines. I think you have fish that are dumping out of the, you know, the sounds and the marshes, a uh, certain percentage of them are heading to the ocean to probably winter, you know, in the surf zone off a little ways. And, you know, there's also, I think a push of fish from up north that may be in the ocean migrating. So I think there's a mingling there, but most of it, I think, is just fish pushing out. And, uh, you know, it seems like when those water temps inside get into the upper 50s, you know, the ocean's going to be like mid to low 60s, and there's just going to be a start, a a really good push in late November. Um, Late November, you're going to have gray trout, speckled trout, black drum, red drum. Uh, There's going to be sheep's head around. Um, You know, those are going to be the big ones. I would say the trout fishing is going to remain good until the water's in the fifties. So sometimes all of December can be phenomenal out there. Um, but you know, once you get down below 50, um, you know, then, you know, your red drum, there's going to be a more chance of them hanging around for a while. The black drum, the sheep's head, they really, bit, they really didn't stay in there. Um, their size will kind of reduce at least on the sheep's head. Um, the bigger ones tend to move off when the water gets down there around that 50 mark. Um, but you know, at times, uh, the black drum can really pile onto there and, uh, all the way in through, through, through March. And I'd say black drum would be the, the big target for me in the, in the end of the winter there coming back into spring. And, uh, man, I, I was trying to follow, but I was trying to follow too much. So the, the trout are there in late November, but you would say your chances of speckled trout and gray trout, they end sometime in January or the least diminish? I mean, again, it it all depends on on local, you know, conditions that we have. I mean, if we're having mild winters and southerly winds, um, you know, you can keep that water there. And I mean, I've caught trout there in every month of the winter. Um, It's just, I would say the predominant time period to be there for those trout is probably going to be up through, you know, Christmas and New Year's. And then it's probably going to plummet to the point where those fish are going to move off to find, uh, the refuge of uh, deeper water somewhere. And then, so black drum continue to be your main target after, after that sort of cold weather, cold water mark, but red drum as well. Um, Again, I'm sorry. I didn't follow the first red drum. Just red drum are just definitely more tolerant to the colder water temps. Um, You know, I mean, I've, I know, you know, I've caught red drum out of a 47 degree surf. It's just, you know, um, I think the red drum are going to, uh, they're going to be there and all winter long, they're just around the corner from the jet, from the jetty, you know, in the, uh, on the shoals of the, uh, of the Cape lookout itself. So there are going to be days where they could just pop in there at any month during the spring from January to March. Um, but you know, they're going to be there. I catch them a lot mixed in with the black drum, uh, going into the winter months. Um, but you know, for sure, black drum and sheep's head are going to be, what I'm going to target mostly going up there, um, you know, say January to March into early April. Um, and the sheep's head size will just reduce. You're still going to catch some keepers, but you know, your larger fish are definitely going to move to your near shore wrecks and your, your, you know, um, 50, 60 feet of water and maybe more. Man, I don't know if I'm going sort of out of uh, context for when you, your talking points, but as far as the Cape Lookout Jetty goes, a very popular spot. So starting in late November into December, is it busy just about every weekend or by that time of year, not so busy? So your holidays are going to be busy. Um, if you throw pretty, I mean, if there's pretty weather on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I mean, there's going to be people that are going fishing, you know, um, but weekdays are generally light, you know, Monday to Fridays are usually going to be, you might be out there by yourself for a while. Um, you know, definitely going to be less, uh, less pressure on the weekdays. Pretty weekends are going to be flat out busy, definitely up through Christmas. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on what kind of boat you're fishing out, I'm usually fishing it in my bay boat. So I'm a little pickier about the weather, but you know, if you have something in 24, 25 foot, 
center console, you can slide out there on those weekend days where, you know, a lot of the smaller skiffs and stuff won't be able to go out. So, um, you know, it's like any other, any other spot. I mean, if it's pretty, people are going to be there for sure. And when is the, when is the like height of it? When is it the most popular where it would be like a parking lot up and down the rocks? I'm going to say, you know, from, we just had, you know, this past Thanksgiving and I'm going to say from then through Christmas, it just seems okay. to be, you know, you got the holidays tied in and the water's right. I mean, uh, you know, December is a well-known month for catching uh, speckled trout in the surf for sure. And, uh, um, you know, but I would definitely say that you're going to see your, your most busy weekends are going to be between, you know, Thanksgiving, which just happened right on up through the holiday. Christmas okay, holiday. man. So the next talking point that you gave me was boat positioning. So we're, we're, we're out there. We found our day. We've, we've got it. We're pulling up to the rock jetties. Help us out with boat positioning. So generally speaking, most people, most of us are going to want to fish the down current side, thinking the predators are going to be laying behind the rocks, popping up and catching any bait that's being moved along. Um, but the reality of it is, is I generally go with that, that premise. Um, but you have to be able to move. I mean, you can be there on the same type tide, the same type day, back to back. And you caught them on one side with incoming water coming from your bow to, you know, you know, your stern is, is pointing towards the jetty. And the next day you might be, you better be on the other side on the down current side. Um, you know, the jetty itself is going to, it's a massive object in the water. So as these currents hit it, there's going to be a break behind it, but there's also lots of scattered boulders individually along that structure as well that themselves are just you know that it might be six eight fish that want to hang out there behind that one rock and um it's a primo spot and you can't fish that throwing across the jetty from the other side so you just have to be mobile you have to be willing to move um the fish will cruise up and down um but in all reality there's our days where they seem to like one section of the jetty um but there's going to be other boats and I'm a big boat watcher. If I've picked my spot where I've done good, I'm definitely going to be paying attention to boats that are on the up current side, um, for example. And some days all you got to do is pull your anchor or pull up your spot lock trolling motor and move around the other side and get somewhere just on the up current side. It makes all the difference. Man, what are most of the boats doing out there? Are they doing spot lock or are they doing an actual anchor? So spot lock's going to be the pretty day work, you know, let's face it. I mean, if it's over a two foot chop and you're in a bay boat or a skiff, um, you know, over two foot, you're going to be pulling, um, you know, you're going to be pulling the prop out of the water, probably drifting around regardless. But the point of a spot lock for me out there is um, I can stay mobile. I don't have to take time to pull an anchor and then reset. Um, but on a rougher day, uh, you know, I'm probably just going to go ahead and drop the anchor. Um, I'm kind of a safety freak. If uh, I'm dropping an anchor on the up current side and the stern's going to settle back against the uh, the jetty, I usually leave my motor running the whole time um, just because, uh, you know, it doesn't take much and you've lifted out a soft stand. Um, I generally, uh, um, I generally if I'm going to fish the down current side, um, I'm going to pretty much go right up to the rocks and I'm going to drop. As soon as I see the black rocks below me, I'm going to drop my anchor straight down and get tangled up in there. I don't use a wreck anchor. I just use the Dan Forth that I have, but um, I've never lost an anchor. It's never been a problem. But, you know, if I'm going to fish the down current side, then I'm usually dropping my anchor right on the whatever scattered rock I see on the outside of the main jetty. I'm going to drop it right in there. Um, and, and because of the nature of the jetty, fish move up and down, right? Um, I've been out there on days when there's 40, 40 boats on either side of this thing. And at any given moment, five or six boats are having a good time and everybody's waiting for the fish to swim down the, the, the jetty and make their way there. Um, but uh, there's also something to be said for having a spot you're confident in on a certain current. 
and anchoring up and giving it some time because oftentimes the fish will come to you. Man, on the upcurrent side, so it's basically sandy bottom that you're anchoring in. Like how how far yeah. out do you like do you need a lot of, and I don't know my anchoring vocabulary. I apologize. You need a lot well, of your scope, road. I mean, it's all about your scope. Um, but yeah, I mean, solid anchoring is three to one scope. So if you're in 10 foot of water, you should probably have 30 feet of rope out before it hits your chain. Um, you know, um, but again, if you're just, if your point is just to fish, then dropping an anchor, you can get away with it. If, if, it all depends on how rough or how much current's out there for the day. But, you know, if you do a, a two to one, it'll give you enough. It might not hold you there for the whole day, but it'll give you enough time to probe that section of the jetty. And then it's and then a little how, bit less line and less work to pull up. And then how close are you trying to position the boat on the upcurrent side? Like how, what's your comfort level with how close you let your boat back down onto the rocks? So I'm up current. So my expectation is that as I present my baits to the edge of the jetty, the scattered rock, whatever there might be, um, you know, I'm looking to be, I mean, there's days that I'm, you know, the closest I usually get myself is going to be like 20 feet. If I'm trout fishing, I'm probably, if, if I'm trying to target the jetty, the base of the jetty for black drum, I'm probably going to get a lot closer than if I'm thinking I'm going to trout fish. And that's because the closer you are, then the more vertical bottom, you know, when I'm fishing for drum and sheep said, it's a bottom presentation. So I want, you know, my lines to, to be as close to vertical or just less angle to them in general, because you have less snags. Uh, if I'm trout fishing, I'm, you know, I'm casting, I'm going to need 50 foot. So I might stay 50 foot off the jetty. Um, if I'm, if I'm wanting to fish, uh, um, you know, fish for trout, because, that's the other thing too, is the fish aren't always directly on the jetty. I mean, I've had days where the trout were oriented 45, 50 feet away from it, you know, and they were out over sand, but they were, that's where they were that day. No. Okay. I follow that, man. And then if I'm going back to the notes, like we have rigs and tackle, but this might be the part of the show where we start going sort of species specific, like what's what rig and tackle are you going to use if it's predominantly trout and then maybe you move us into more of your bottom fishing i'll let i'll let you lead but i, I think that might make sense as far as how to present this next topic area so hands down artificials um for for artificials i'm going with i'm going to go with the lead head jig um more often than not you're welcome to use whatever you color you want but uh generally speaking if it's white or pearl um, you know, that's a good place to start. The water's generally clean out there. Um, you know, the old green grub, any and all of it will work, but I do my best, most consistent catching, uh, with, uh, definitely with white and pearl colors. And in fact, uh, there's a slam shady out. That's like a pearl with a bunch of gold fleck in it. And I haven't used that in the ocean yet. I did for flounder for jigging, but, uh, it's been working really well inshore. So I'm looking, to, looking forward to using that, but um, and I'm a big believer in if it's regular Z-Man plastics, I'm going to smear it with Procure. Um, and by late winter, there's often times that, uh, you know, I'm switching over to, uh, to gulp. And the big thing about gulp fishing out there for a jig, the old black drum will fall for the gulp, um, just about as well as they'll fall for, uh, you know, cut bait, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but, uh, the jig heads are going to vary. I mean, you want your jig to be moved along by the current. You want it to be able to stay close to the bottom in general. Um, you don't want to throw an eighth ounce jig and it never gets down to the presentation zone. But in, 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 uh, I'd say day to day, I am going to be using three sixteenths up to three eighths ounce. I've had a few days where I used a half ounce jig head, but it's always going to be three sixteenths quarter, um, or three eighths almost always. Um, you know, most, like I said, most of my baits are going to be jerk shad style, uh, white and pearl, uh, the Z-Man jerk shads. And then, you know, later in the winter or when I'm uh, more worried about black drum, I will switch over and, you know, I'll keep some gulp on the boat, um, the jerk shads, because they'll definitely jump all over it. But again, whether you're up current or down current, if you're, if you start out up current, you may only need a 3 to jig the contours of the jetty and throw around and still hit bottom as that water's you know, heading towards your stern and on in. 
Whereas, you know, uh, you get to the other side and, you know, you might need, because you're throwing into the current, you might need a three eight so that as soon as you cast up along that contour or that edge, she's getting to the bottom where the fish might be right up tight. Um, but you know, you just need to vary it. And, and if, if you're just constantly snagging and constantly, uh, hitting bottom too hard, then you have too much weight. So, um, if, with jig fishing, I see people commit to a weight one, you know, and that's what they tie on and that's what they use. But in reality, if they went to a three eights for that hour and a half that the current was ripping, they'd have been presenting right every single time. So with the uh, soft plastic, with that artificial, and I guess we're talking predominantly trout, even though you did mention gulp and black drum. So we're saying that the bottom is basically the presentation zone, the strike zone. That's, that's typically the game we're playing if we're trouting on the rock jetty. Yeah, man. Trout are definitely, you know, I mean, everywhere we fish for them, I mean, you know, especially where we're fishing for them with current. Um, trout are definitely bottom oriented fish and they dart up and grab their targets. Um, but, you know, they're lazy like anything else. But we definitely are wanting to make contact with the bottom periodically. We don't have to be dragging along on it. We don't have to be thumping it. But, you know, you definitely want where your jig is, you know, you're bringing it up through the bottom two foot of the water column um you know and making contact with the bottom because you got to remember most of the time out here there's some kind of tide or some kind of current and there's always a current break either behind something or you know with their bellies tight to the bottom for sure and is i guess if i'm on your boat is the instruction like typical cold water months like move it slow like keep it a slow presentation or how do you advise people who are on your boat so we're usually we're, we're usually dealing with a sweeping current you know so there oftentimes the water's hitting at an angle and you'll actually you know carry your bait down um so there's lots of days where you can cast quartering away off of your stern and that that bait is going to present and it's going to work its way off of the jetty you know um and there's days where you can throw up there, there'll be a, a due west current coming straight down the length of the jetty and you literally throw up up current a little bit and you're literally fishing parallel to the jetty the whole way. Um, there's just so many different variables out there with the wind, the fact that it's the ocean, long shore currents. But we can get into that later. Um, but uh, um, if you're not getting bit up right next to the jetty and you've dropped your anchor, you guys should be probing all around the boat. Somebody should be casting off the bow. Somebody should be casting off of midships. Um, cause quite often those fish will hang in, in various locations. Sometimes they're, like I said, 40, 50 feet away from it. So what else do you like to throw besides uh, soft plastic jig heads, man? What else is on the break day boat for these winter months? At times when the current's a little slow, I'll throw some MR 17s, um, you know, some suspending jerk baits, but in all honesty, if I'm going up there outside of maybe some mirror lures, um, my go-to is definitely going to be plastics. Just, I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, you don't need to, you don't need much more than that. You want to have some colors with you. Definitely. You know, um, I've had days where, uh, a new penny took off, you know, and was the bite for the day. But generally speaking, um, when it comes to plastic, it just seems like jerk shads. And, uh, um, I don't, I don't do, I don't even do real well on shrimp, um, imitations up there um you know day in and day out but uh as far as lures maybe a few mr-17s and that's going to be about it then what about the uh you were talking about straight up bottom fishing man what about our bait and rigs or lures and rigs for more of a bottom fishing presentation so uh number one is going to be a carolina rig um i'm going to vary the hook size um cold water months if you're up current from the jetty and you put a couple chunks of mullet up against that jetty, um, and there's a red drum that comes swimming down that jetty, he is going to eat it. It's just, they're not going to pass it up. But uh, my go-to, if I'm throwing like a piece of mullet or a piece of Manhattan or something like that, um, I'm going to go with, you know, probably a 40 pound fluoro leader. Uh, fluoro is not really necessary too much, but uh, I just use it consistently. Um, you know, a three-aught Kaylee hook or, or a appropriate, four or five alt circle hook. Um, you know, I generally, when I'm throwing around structure, 
I don't want a long leader because that bait's going to whip around and it could find a crevice too easy. So I generally keep my, you know, leaders like six inches or under, um, you know, and then a barrel swivel and a, an appropriate weighted egg sinker um, above that barrel swivel on the main line. Um, that's also going to be, I might modify that hook to a number two O'Shaughnessy um, for fishing bits of shrimp or bits of crab. Um, but you know that I, I tend to use that uh, Carolina rig when there's lots of current and things are going to move around a little bit. And another go-to in the winter months, as far as bottom fishing goes, um, is going to be just your standard chicken rig tied on 30 or 40 pound monofilament with a high hook and a low hook. Um, and you know, again, I'm going to be using like a number two O'Shaughnessy because that's going to cover me on the black drum. It cover me on a red drum if he eats it and the sheep's head can get it in their mouth pretty easily because most of the sheep's head are going to be like most of them are going to be sub legal but you know you're going to catch some pretty ones out there as well um when it comes to the sheep's head and the black drum you know of course they're big crustacean eaters so shrimp mole crabs if you've had any and you froze any or buy some of the frozen ones um you know hard crab works it's not as easy to deal with with hooking it but uh i'd say you're never going to beat fresh shrimp. And by fresh shrimp, um, I'm talking about going to your seafood dealer and, you know, they're going to have the trawl shrimp and the big green tails, the nice ones that we might normally eat. Um, but when it comes to using shrimp bait and your bottom fishing out there, without a doubt, local North Carolina, even if it was frozen once, is way better than any other shrimp bait you're going to use. I mean, it's big difference. I've seen a big difference between that and then just going and buying the stuff you get from the tackle store. You putting big chunks of that shrimp on the hook or are you putting modest? What's the theory? So, What's you the know, philosophy like, there? You know, you're, you're regular summertime surf fishing, right? You cut your shrimp into the little segments um, and you use little pieces and you go across the grain. You don't, you don't ever go down the vein of the shrimp. It just makes it that much easier for them to get it off. Um, some people shell it. Some people don't. Some days I do. Some days I don't. Um, some days I think it makes a difference and others I don't. Um, but, uh, you know, you're talking about a bigger shrimp that you're going to be using, right? Cause these are like, you know, eating size shrimp. Um, so when you cut one segment off of it, it's going to be a quite a big chunk of bait there. Um, on a big green tail, that first segment, it might be as big as the end of your thumb. And again, I can't stress enough. Uh, it's so much more important to hook it across the, uh, uh, shrimp body, you know, uh, perpendicular to the vein instead of trying to run the hook down the vein. They just have a lot easier time getting it off. Um, but, uh, you know, the number two O'Shaughnessy, um, I use cheap hooks. You can go get mosquito hooks. You can go get a whole bunch of other high dollar hooks, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to break stuff off. And if you're fishing the jetty, especially bottom fishing and you're not breaking stuff off, you're probably not fishing in the right spots. Um, but that high low rig is, uh, really, really successful. And uh, the Carolina rig, I just tend to use it if, if, if I'm experiencing more drift with my bait, um, then I'm going to uh, definitely go with the Carolina rig just because it tumbles easier. I mean, it's got, you know, it's got one less hook and a couple less loops on it. So uh, it just works better in the current. Um, I don't know if there's, I mean, I'm still on rigs and tackle, but I, we've talked about artificials, you know, plastics, and we've talked about your bottom fishing presentation. Is there anything we you wanted to say in this section that I haven't set you up to say? So the big thing with the jetty, um, and it can be on fire one day and you can go up there the next day and it's literally a desert. Um, you know, it's not, there's been a lot of good days made, a lot of heroes made up there, but you can go up there and literally, despite what you do, there just isn't anything there. Um, but the one thing that I can't stress, and I think people will get what I'm talking about. The Cape Lookout Jetty, I believe, is like 2,500 feet long. And there's a whole bunch of places that people are in love with, but they're only fishing 3% of that jetty. Um, whether you're bottom fishing or throwing jigs, it doesn't really matter in the wintertime. There's a whole bunch of jetty that's there to explore. Um, there's jetty you can't see. Um, there's 
days where they want access to 12 foot of water instead of wanting to be up closer to that surf zone. Um, and I think I alluded to that earlier. I move around a lot. And that's the big thing with the spot lock. Like I said, you can hang in an area for five, 10, 15 minutes. If you're not getting the results you want, you can move along. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of structure there and it's not just the parts that you can see. And then we had tides and wind listed, but I think you've talked about tides and wind. I had it as like a sort of like the last point. Is there anything else to add to the tide and wind conversation? So as a general rule, if you have a northerly, an easterly, um, you can fish the jetty. Um, because the winds are coming off the land. And again, once it's over 15 knots, you know, yeah, yeah, a northwester is brutal. But anything with west in it and in, in south, west to southwest, south southwest, um, if it's over 15, it's not bay boat time. You know, you can take your 23 center console out there. But, you know, if there's something coming out of the west or the uh, um, southwest directions, northwest, and it's going to get over 15 knots or 15 miles an hour, it's not going to be fun in a bay boat. Again, a bigger boat, you can go out there and deal with it. Um, in fact, there's days where I fish the jetty with a bigger boat, um, and I just control the boat and crab it down and let my anglers present. Most of that's going to be lure fishing um, just because the boat's moving. But, uh, you know, you can also fish it without locking yourself down. Um, if there's active game fish on it and you can keep the boat backed up and use forward or reverse as needed. Uh, you can present lures pretty well along with it, but westerlies and southerly winds are bad. North, north, uh, north and northeast, east, usually it's gonna be calm in there along the beach. Um, on a true south wind, as long as it doesn't get real bad, um, especially uh, um, you can sneak around uh, the backside by Harkers and avoid the ocean on that hard southerly, but if you get tucked in there along that first third of the jetty on a south wind, you can usually be in some pretty good conditions. Um, you know, I like to think about what my tide's doing in my wind. Um, if I got an incoming tide, that's going to be coming across the ocean, right? It's going to be heading to Barden's Inlet down along the Cape parallel. Um, if there's going to be a 15 mile an hour south wind behind that incoming current, um, it might not be best to be there when it's full blown moving along, you know, might want to get there at the end of it um, and fish the end of that tide slowing down. And, you know, when everything switches around, you might move around on the jetty, get to the other side and uh, fish that falling, falling water. But south and westerlies are, are uh, pretty rough out there. Man, uh, as you're sitting here talking, I just sort of thought like this wasn't in any of our show notes or anything, but when you're out there and you're watching other people, what are some of the, what's some of the bigger mistakes or what's a mistake that you see other people making out there that if they were to do something different, it might produce better results. In all honesty, I, I catch a lot of fish. I'm, I'm successful with my clients, but you know, it's like anytime I'm on the water, I mean, there's those days where that you're watching that one boat and, man, it looks like he's got a green grub on with a curl tail or, you know, that looks like it's got some chartreuse in it. I mean, that can literally make the difference. Um, I think people, uh, I think they get too close lots of times, depending on how they're fishing. Um, you know, if you're chucking lures and you're using light tackle, um, you know, you don't need to get right up next to it. Um, and I, I see people, they're not letting the water move their lure for them. Um, it's, they're too worried about bringing it back to the boat when they should let the current that's out there sweeping it sideways um, and let them stay in that strike zone a little bit longer. Um, and I see people just sit in a place too long. Even on those days where there's like only five, six, seven boats out there, um, I see boats that just sit and maybe they had a good day there five days ago or last weekend, but may not be the good spot that time, you know, for sure. Move around. Man, uh, okay, and then last question on the Cape Lookout, just final thoughts on, you know, piece of advice or philosophy for someone targeting the Cape Lookout rock jetty. Buy a spot lock trolling motor. No. <laughs> <coughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, 
don't try to force it. If conditions are rough out there and you won't be able to present, um, that plays a big role in it. And I think a lot of people go when the conditions aren't right, like running out to the jetty after it blew Southwest for three days at 30 miles an hour. There's no point in going if that fourth day is five and the water slick calm, you know, that entire beach is going to be covered up in mud. Uh, you can't force the jetty to do something that you want it to do uh, when the conditions aren't right. You just really can't. Um, so once you get to know it and once you get to figure it out, you know, just just don't force your day out there. Um, and you don't need to stay there all day. Um, some days, if you don't do much, you might as well move on. You know, there's something else somewhere else to do. Well, Justin, man, I know that you are, you know, you're, you're active, you're busy all season long, often working a couple of boats. So at this point, I'd like you to just let everyone know what else break day charters is doing when it's not at the Cape lookout rock jetty in the wintertime. So, you know, right now until, uh, you know, from now until probably late December, speckled trout, red drum is going to be phenomenal, uh, inshore. So I'm running that in my bay boat. Um, you know, king mackerel fishing, um, you know, up until the water is going to drop out here and probably middle of this month is going to be some really good king mackerel fishing on near shore still. And then that'll probably push offshore into deeper water, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, on into December, you know, and, and this whole time we got false albacore fishing along the beach, fly fishing, light tackle casting. Uh, they're going to be a phenomenal target up through uh, December. Um and then, uh, you know, moving into December, of course, I'm thinking about bluefin tuna. I do run charters for them, the Giants. Um, but, you know, usually our kill season starts December 1. Um, I'm eligible as a commercial fisherman, but uh, I do run charters for that experience as well. Um, and, you know, it's eastern North Carolina. If it stays warm, uh, we'll have phenomenal fishing on into January inside. And, you know, of course, the winter months are going to be me mostly, uh, you know, working over the black drum around, you know, structure, whether it's the jetty or bridges or whatever that might be. But if it stays pretty and the water stays above 50, uh, lots of speckled trout stay inside the marshes and they're going to be right up there through March until they start moving around to start their spring thing. Then well, give us the uh, spring too, man. I mean, beyond the winter, give me the quick, the quick highlight reel, highlight reel of spring, summer and fall. Man, it's just my life is speckled trout, red drum, flounder when they let me, right? Um, you know, but I'm going to say March, you're going to finish up doing your cold water fishing for trout. Um, a lot of your drum, or there are going to be some around your inshore structure for sure. Um, lots of them are going to be out on the, in the surf zone. Um, but, uh, you know, this past year, for example, from March until now, the red drum bite's been ridiculous this year. But, you know, March for me is going to be red drum, still having the tr speckled trout in the backwater. Um, you know, March, April, uh, down in the sound. I love a sea mullet bite. I do. I know they're not super glamorous, but, you know, a, uh, March, April, and May are going to be, you know, that the time for that. And of course, the gray trout, they make their big showing in April and May. So uh, they're one of my favorites. As much as I love a speckled trout, a gray trout puts him to shame on the rod, um, bending the rod. Um, and, you know, I do marsh to ocean. So all that inshore stuff. So follow out into the ocean, um, you know, springtime. It used to be flounder, right, guys? But that's, well, you know, that's still a sore <laughs> subject, but we're going with that. And, uh, you know, you're going to see some false albacore and bonita in April and May. Um, then we're moving right into our Spanish mackerel, our cobia, uh, you know, grouper opens up May 1st, uh, Spanish, ma I mean, king mackerel, live bait and pulling dead bait, near shore stuff. Um, and of course, May and June is going to be mahi time. Um, and all summer long is going to be drum, you know, speckled trout's going to be good, you know, potentially good up through the spring. Our spring bites usually not the same as our fall bite, but, uh, you know, Th that's going to be good up through, uh, you know, May and then, uh, red drum just takes over for the summertime as far as inshore. Um, and you know, late May is going to be time to start, uh, targeting those big Spanish mackerel with live bait. King mackerel start to get mixed in near shore. Um, and again, through that whole time, it's going to be the speckled trout. Uh, I mean, the, the gray trout out there as well, underneath all that stuff on the reefs. Um, 
and it just gets better and better, man. Every year it's a vicious cycle. What do I do? What do I do? I mean, I know I gave you a broad question. I mean, you got a couple of different boats You've, and like, I, I knew your business motto, March to ocean. I knew you're covering it all, but I, I wanted to give you a chance just to let everyone else know, give them a taste of everything else that you have in your arrows you have in your quiver. Man, yeah, man. Uh, Justin, it, it's easy to talk to you, man. I l enjoy it every time. And uh, it was good to connect tonight, man. Yeah, brothers, good to see you, man. I thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, dude, thank you for being a guest. And we'll talk soon, Justin. All right, man. Take care, brother. Billy Thorpe. All right, Gary. Good episode, man. Ton of information, Justin. Captain Justin is uh, just a wealth of knowledge, dude, when it comes to fishing in general. So he uh, is, man. He's an easy talker. He likes to share, man. And, you know, he think you know, he's one of those. He's thinking about it and reflecting about it and tweaking it. And, you know, he's got his thoughts and a plan. I mean, I, I don't know. It's I enjoy talking fishing with him. It's easy. Yeah. Yeah, man. He's he's good. And I think a couple of things, a couple of takeaways. Uh, the first one is if for the jig head size, change it out. Try something new. I never do that. That's why I always I always think of the <laughs> stuff I never do. I'm like, I'll get out there and fish with the same size for <laughs> five hours and cuss all day. Like you can't catch anything, uh, but switch it up. Easy. And, and then move around. Like I think that's too, you know, fishing those jetties. Sometimes it's, uh, you, you get settled in, you get comfortable and, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm probably talking out of my league cause I don't have a boat. I don't anchor down, but <laughs> I'm just imagining if I did, if I didn't have that trolling motor, the spot lock trolling motor, if I anchored down, it's like, okay, I got settled in. Now I'm going to stay here for a while. Uh, but don't be afraid to pull that thing up and move around. So I think there's two things like switch up your game a little bit. Don't get, don't get so sold on doing one thing all day long. That'd be my takeaway. Well, I tell you, man, as we, as we mentioned sometimes on this podcast, I am fortunate that I get to fish with a lot of these great fishermen and high up on the list of what I appreciate about it is I don't have to make decisions, man. It's not for me to decide, do we fish here longer mm -hmm. and work it out or do we move and try another place? I mean, I'm so fortunate that I don't, when I'm fishing with them, I don't have to make that decision. But yeah, man, I mean, you know, I think I like that approach of like, if it's just not working, man, then don't force it. Like, let's move around. Let's try something else. Mm, spoken like a true one percenter, Gary. Thanks for sharing that. Right. <laughs> well, I the decision I make is what sandwich, what sandwich do I make to bring on the boat today with Justin Ragsdale? What sandwich is going to be the best for the Cape Lookout Rock Jetty? Peanut butter and jelly or the tuna I caught on yesterday's trip? I don't know. <laughs> so hard <laughs> you're a great episode man. a great guest and you always do a good job at, at getting the information that we want to know and that our listeners uh, you know want to know so really valuable uh, show appreciate it man and uh, we'll see you in the next episode and thank you we'll do man warehouse and bland landscaping co for making it all possible and RA hitch appreciate you all and we'll talk to you soon gary thanks man Fisherman's